One of the most successful lotteries in the world is the Dutch National Postcode Lottery. Unlike conventional lotteries, you don't win if you have the right lottery ticket, but you lose if you don't have the right lottery ticket. Let me explain. This is because the Dutch Postcode Lottery uses the postal codes of the Dutch people as the winning numbers. If your number of your neighborhood is drawn, but you don't have a lottery ticket, you are the loser of your street and many of your neighbors who instead bought tickets are the winners. Regret aversion and the tendency to prevent losses leads to a disproportionate number of people buying a ticket. But regret and loss aversion aren't just powerful motivators to buy lottery tickets. No, they can also make firms more innovative. Why is that? Most companies struggle to innovate. Once they find their recipe for success, they apply it over and over again until they no longer succeed. These companies miss new opportunities and don't see it coming in time when new players take over. Sooner or later, this is a problem for almost all companies. But in this video, I show you how to get any business to open up to innovation. I show you how to become a true innovation leader. And the best part is, you don't even have to be the CEO of a company to revitalize it. I mean, there is no harm in being the CEO, but almost anyone can contribute. Most innovation efforts fail because they go against human nature. People are generally risk averse and prefer the status quo. Nothing illustrates this better than the Monty Hall dilemma which has been examined in dozens of studies. In the Monty Hall dilemma, you are faced with three doors in a game show. Behind two doors is a goat, that is a blank. Behind one door is the top prize, for example, a brand new car. In the first round, you bet randomly on one door. Now the host opens one of the two other doors. Behind this door is always one of the two goats. Now we have another chance to switch. The interesting thing is that hardly anyone switches in this situation. In fact, more than 80% of people follow the stay strategy. Yet the switch strategy has a two-third chance of winning the top prize. The stay strategy, on the other hand, has only a one-third chance of winning it. If you want to know why that is, I made a whole video on this phenomenon. You can find it here and in the description of this video. But why do so few people switch? Even assuming that both strategies are equally successful, there should be about the same number of people switching as not switching. But apparently it's assumed that people regret losing at the game more if they have switched than if they stick with their decision. People faced with such a choice think, if I switch and it was a top price behind my door, then I lose what I already had. I would never be able to look in the mirror again my life will be an embarrassment. However, if the top price is behind another door and not their door, they succinctly think, well, it just wasn't meant to be, let's have ice cream. People hate to lose. Losses are about as popular as mosquito bites on the face and rocks in the shoe at the same time. When we feel like we might lose something, we do a lot to avoid that uncomfortable feeling of regret in the first place. And that's why most people stick with the status quo. It almost seems like there's nothing we can do about it. Because how can you do anything against human nature? It can only become as successful as telling children not to play with their food. But wait a minute, do you ever watch football, aka soccer? In football, there's the penalty shootout. For example, in a tournament, games are decided this way if the score is still tied after overtime. Last year, in December, there was the Argentina vs France final in the Men's World Cup, which 1.5 billion people around the world watched. In this penalty shootout, both goalkeepers jumped to either side for every kick. And this is no exception. A 2006 study in professional football leagues in Israel showed that in 94% of the cases, the goalkeeper jumps to one of the two sides. Only in 6% of the analyzed penalties, he stayed in the center of the goal. Although the probability of blocking a shot is more than twice as high when staying in the center instead of jumping left or right. Let that roll off your tongue. 
These men earn millions of dollars and have the chance to literally decide who wins or loses final games and they regularly take an action that more than halves their chances of success. Consequently, the behavior of goalkeepers is anything but optimal or rational. But why do they do it? The goalie situation is basically the opposite of the Monty Hall dilemma. Staying in the center of the goal and losing seems to be the most embarrassing and regretful choice. Jumping aside is better than doing nothing. After all, they tried with all their power to hold the goal. The bias is called action bias and occurs whenever action is the norm. Status quo bias means, when in doubt, I prefer to do nothing. In action, then, is the norm. Action bias means, I would rather do something than do nothing. In this case, action is the norm. But how do status quo bias and action bias affect innovation? Many executives identify with their core business and do not want to lose it. On the other hand, anything new and innovative is perceived as a growth opportunity. You could also say as a game. That doesn't sound so bad at first, but as we see shortly, it's a big problem. Because if the core business is the norm, then innovation is the deviation from the norm. A company that has a core business but wants to innovate is therefore more like the Monty Hall dilemma than the Goldie situation. And that's why those in charge prefer not to act, are cautious, avoid risks and often kill real innovations before they can become successful. They'd rather stick with a line of business that will become meaningless in the next 10 years than risk building a new business. To change that, we have to turn innovation from a Monty Hall dilemma into a Goldie situation. And how do we do that? The answer is reframing. Depending on how a situation is framed, people behave differently. A quick example. Suppose you are the boss of an industrial company with three factories and 6,000 employees. The economy puts you in a tough spot and the company may be facing closure. You can choose between two plans. Plan A will save one of the three factories and 2,000 jobs. Plan B has a one-third chance of saving all three plans and all 6,000 jobs but a two-third chance of saving no plans and no jobs. Which plan would you be more likely to choose? Most people, around 80%, prefer plan A. They'd rather play it safe than risk everything. But imagine I would give you a different set of options. Under plan A, two of the three plans and 4,000 jobs would be lost. Under plan B, there's a two-third chance of losing all three plans and all 6,000 jobs, but a one-third chance of losing no plans and no jobs. Logically, these are the same options as the first choice, but psychologically, they don't feel the same. In the last set of options, the majority of people, also around 80%, now prefer plan B. Their preferences reverse. The situation is the same in both scenarios, but it is framed differently. When we talk about saving jobs, we use gain framing. Consequently, people are then risk averse. When we talk about losing jobs, we use loss framing. And most people then take more risks. That's the framing effect. So the question that comes up is, how do we make innovation the norm and make non-innovation feel like a loss? Reframing innovation works when you highlight the cost of inaction so that people regret not innovating. One way to do this is through the funeral speech. In this video here, I talk about this exercise as a way to reframe innovation as a prevented loss. You can find the link also in the description. Because when people feel that they could lose everything if they don't innovate, then innovative action becomes the norm. Another element is to establish innovation as something normal. For example, innovation should become part of the career plan of employees. It should feel embarrassing if you haven't done anything innovative in your company. Just like many people study after school because they don't want to regret not studying, regret should be used here to get people involved in innovation projects. And also you should do recurring things and avoid single actions. A single innovative project can feel like an exception, making the core business feel even more like the norm. If there are many innovation projects in all possible areas of the company, 
that is much more powerful in shaping the norm than a single project. And recurring actions, for example, a guest lecture in your headquarter every month, can also make thinking outside the box the norm. You can find many pieces of advice on how to create more innovation through reframing in my new book, Reframe, The Psychology of Innovation. Yes, I wrote a book. I spent the last 12 months writing it and two years researching before that. The book describes how biases hinder innovation and how we can use reframing to change biases in favor of innovation. You can pre-order the English or the German version now. The German version will be released in September 2023 and the English version a couple of weeks later. Find the details on how to pre-order in the description. My name is Felix and this channel is about the psychology of innovation. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.